Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Carla and John Lewis? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Carla Jean Lewis was born in June of 1962 and lived in the state of Michigan. She earned a bachelor's degree in accounting. Carla worked for the Whirlpool Corporation for over 20 years before taking a job with Bayer Pharmaceuticals. When she was 21, she married a man named Steve. The couple divorced in 2007. After the divorce, Carla went online to find a new lover. This is when she met John Benton Lewis. He had been born in July of 1968, so he was six years younger than Carla. John had been in some trouble with the law. He committed burglary and was convicted of a felony as a result. People who knew Carla did not understand what she saw in John, but Carla was attracted to him. By 2009, the couple was living together. On June 30, 2012, Carla and John married. John was collecting disability payments and made a little bit of money through repairing small engines. Carla continued to work in accounting and was the primary financial provider. In 2010, the couple purchased a house on the 1400 block of Lawndale Avenue in Niles, Michigan. It was a three bedroom, one bathroom ranch. In 2014, John started growing marijuana in a room in the basement of the house. The room was about 10 feet by 10 feet and hidden behind a bookshelf like the bookshelf was the door to the room. Within a couple years, John became an advocate for the legalization of marijuana in Michigan. He drove a green truck that had marijuana leaves painted on it, as well as the words cannabis cures on the back window. John had a green motorcycle as well. It also had marijuana leaves painted on it. He was making a lot of new friends in the area with his commitment to marijuana. Relatives said that strange and scary-looking people were at John's house all the time. These people may have been there to acquire marijuana. In May of 2017, John opened a store on Bell Road called the Seven Leaves Compassion Club. The store sold marijuana-related products and offered education about medical marijuana. Not surprisingly, the store lost money. Carla was becoming increasingly upset with paying all the bills and covering John's losses. John had been keeping a secret from Carla. He was having three affairs. One of his mistresses was named April. He gave her marijuana and money in exchange for sex. This relationship had been going on for six years. Before moving to the timeline of the crime, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Aura. Have you ever searched for yourself on the internet and been shocked to see your personal information exposed on one of those public listing sites. It's pretty disconcerting to see all that information out there and it can be overwhelming thinking about how to get rid of it. What's more, data brokers are making a fortune selling your information to spammers, robocallers, and others who want to learn more about you, like where you live. That's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers exposing your information and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally required to remove your information if you ask them to, but they make it very difficult to do so. Let Aura handle it for you. You can try Aura for free for two weeks using my link. Aura also does so much more to protect you and your family from online threats you can't see. It's very easy to set up. You don't have to download several different apps to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. You get everything at one affordable price. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online so you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. You can either let people continue to exploit and profit off your private information, or you can go to Aura.com slash Dr. Todd Grande to start your two-week free trial. The link is also in the description for this video. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On August 13, 2017, at 5.45 p.m., 49-year-old John Lewis called 911 and told the police that intruders entered his home and shot his 55-year-old wife, Carla. 
The police arrived at 5.56 p.m. They discovered Carla's body in the marijuana grow room in the basement. She had been shot five times and did not survive. John Lewis was next to her and unharmed. Here's what the police found during the course of their investigation. John Lewis told the police a terrifying story about a home invasion. He said that he asked his wife to accompany him to the grow room in the basement to help him move marijuana plants. As they were moving the plants, two black men appeared in the doorway and started shooting. The men never said anything. After killing Carla, they took her vehicle, wallet, and credit cards. A safe in the house was open and empty. The police later found Carla's vehicle about 11 miles from the Lewis family house. It was in a cornfield on Yankee Street in Cass County. The spent cartridge cases found at the scene were made of steel instead of brass. They were an unusual ammunition brand called Tula Ammo, which is made in Russia. An acquaintance of John's named Justin contacted the police as they were interviewing John. He had heard about the shooting on the news and had information relevant to the case. Justin indicated that at 1.53 p.m., John contacted him and directed him to go to the Seven Leaves Compassion Club store. John wanted Justin to retrieve a bag containing eight boxes of nine-millimeter cartridges and one magazine. Justin picked up the bag and kept it in his trunk. He turned it over to the police. The nine-millimeter ammunition matched the spent cartridge cases found in John's house. The police spoke to John's mistress, April, who said that in 2016, John proclaimed his love for her. He asked her if she would leave her boyfriend. He also wanted to know if it would make a difference if his wife, Carla, was dead. On a separate occasion, John talked about killing his wife with Xanax. April claimed that she believed John was being humorous. I guess like some type of fool April joke. The mistress said that on the day of the murder, she arrived at John's house at about 1 p.m. and they had sex. He received a text message around 2 p.m. and quickly drove her home. She believed that John had recently told his wife Carla about the affair and Carla was packing up her belongings to move out. On August 16, John was charged with first-degree murder. He was also charged with possession with intent to manufacture marijuana. John had a license to grow up to 12 marijuana plants for medical use but he violated at least two of the rules. For example, the grow room did not have a lock and other people had access to the room. The police knew this because Carlo's body was found in that room. On February 19, 2019, John Lewis was convicted of first-degree murder and possession with intent to manufacture marijuana. Just over a month later, on March 25, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now moving to my analysis. John Lewis maintains his innocence. He is staying with the story that two black men killed his wife. The state, of course, disagrees. They believe that John murdered his wife for money and to have the freedom to continue his other romantic relationships. This brings me to the question, was John guilty of murder? Let's take a look at the evidence, both for and against the idea that John was guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. At the time of Carla's murder, John's business was failing and she was financially supporting him. She was not pleased with this situation. John stood to gain over $300,000 from the death of his wife between life insurance and her retirement money. Starting on August 7, which was less than a week before the murder, John made multiple internet searches for guns and silencers. On another occasion, he asked a friend for a recommendation about a gun. John was a convicted felon, and was prohibited from owning a firearm. John was having affairs with three different women. On August 8, he contacted one of those women and said that he and Carla, quote, will be over sooner than you think, unquote. He told another affair partner that he no longer wanted to be with Carla. When John was interviewed by the police, he claimed that he had a happy marriage. When the police responded to John's house on August 13, there was no sign of forced entry, the house had not been ransacked. John's wife was shot five times and killed, but John was unharmed. He had not made any attempt to render aid to Carla. John's story about two black men shooting his wife did not make any sense. 
Prior to the murder, John directed an acquaintance to retrieve ammunition from the store, which matched the spent cartridge cases found at the scene of the murder. The ammunition was an unusual brand. Moving to the exculpatory factors, the murder weapon was never found. John's mistress, April, had two felony convictions in 2014 and was not a reliable witness. Investigators found an unidentified palm print on a door of the house and unidentified DNA in Carla's vehicle. John advertised his marijuana obsession vigorously, which made him a target for unsavory characters. Everybody knew that he had marijuana in his house and may have money in his house. When considering all the evidence, do I believe that John Lewis was guilty of murder? Yes. In my opinion, he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't really have any doubt that he was responsible for his wife's murder. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Carla married when she was young and stayed with her husband for a long time in an unhappy relationship. After her divorce, she may have been feeling a bit desperate to make up for lost time, like she viewed her long marriage as creating many missed opportunities. She wanted to have the fun that is normally associated with being young and reckless. Motivated by these desires, Carla lowered her standards significantly and ended up with John Lewis as a boyfriend and then as a husband. He didn't have much going for him as far as being a romantic partner, but he was technically alive, and his risk-taking behavior may have been interpreted by Carla as endearing and stimulating. Carla was willing to overlook his felony conviction, his low income, and his many disturbing behaviors. She insisted that he changed from his evil ways, and she observed tremendous potential in him. If she had been referring to his potential for dangerousness, her observation would have been accurate. John was an undesirable romantic partner who caused a lot of embarrassment and financial stress for Carla. He was standoffish, rude, withdrawn, and just about everything in his life was guided by his obsession with marijuana. He would skip important family events unless they occurred in Michigan, where he was legally allowed to possess and use marijuana. It was like he could not be away from marijuana for more than a few hours. He told Carla that he had to skip out-of-state events because he was afraid of being in an airplane, but John was always flying high. Not long before the murder, Carla discovered at least one of John's affairs. She supported him while he lost money with his business. She put up with his other idiosyncrasies, but Carla was not going to tolerate an affair. John somehow obtained a firearm and cheap ammunition. On August 13, 2017, John contacted his acquaintance, Justin, to hide ammunition as John prepared to commit the murder. It didn't make any sense for John to tip his hand. Perhaps this was a marijuana-assisted decision. John lured or forced Carla into the grow room and shot her to death. He then drove her vehicle to the cornfield where he had staged a vehicle so he could get home or had someone pick him up. During this trip, he disposed of the firearm. Despite efforts to escape responsibility, John left behind a tremendous amount of evidence. He had no chance of avoiding a conviction. John constructed a lazy, callous, sadistic, and obvious murder. Now moving to my final thoughts. The case of Carla and John Lewis can be summarized in this way. A misguided, manipulative, and Machiavellian Michigan man married a meticulous money minder. The man amassed murky morals, multiplied mistresses, and met with monetary misfortune in his medical marijuana market, magnifying his misery. His misdeeds mangled his marital moorings, and the misconduct morphed into monstrous motives. In a moment of macabre madness, his malice materialized into metal missiles as he mercilessly murdered his mate. To mask the mayhem, he manufactured and maligned mystical men, but mysterious munitions marked his misdeed. The miserable miscreant will be marooned in a metallic mansion for many moons, where he can mourn his missing marijuana. Those are my thoughts on the case of Carla and John Lewis. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.